Hello there, Bourbon Real Talk. Listeners and watchers, Randy Sullivan back with a very special episode with a very special guest. You asked for it. You're getting it. My lovely wife, Lindsay Sullivan, back on the podcast after episode 100. Welcome back, honey. Say hello to all of your new fans. <laughs> and remember, you got to talk a little louder. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you got to talk a little bit louder. Today, we are going to discuss my top five bourbons of all time. All time, okay? See, people ask me all the time, they're like, what's your favorite bourbon, right? And it's kind of like picking between your kids. You know, what are you going to do, right? There's so many that you love. Uh, but I've, I've spent some time thinking about it, and I've narrowed it down, right? And so what we're actually going to do is we are going to go through my top five, but these whiskeys are whiskeys that are still in production, okay? Because I've, I've had some oddball stuff, right? Dusty bourbons, like special one-time releases, things like that. And those are things that I didn't feel like it was useful for us to share that information because no one's ever going to see this, right? Um, you're not going to go out and find a, a, a Pappy Van Winkle 25-year decanter in a bar, even for a pour, right? But these are all whiskeys that are annual release whiskeys. So I, I thought it would be fun for you to try them, right? Because you, you drink a little whiskey. A little bit. Yeah? Yeah? What, what, uh, what's, what's your favorite whiskey so far? I mean, I think we know from the last episode that my favorite is the Angel's Envy Rye. Yeah, but that's like that's like dessert whiskey. I know, but it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Still, still your fave. Still my fave. Haven't moved on yet. I mean, I I, I love the Prideful Goat. I love Unallocated. I'm a little partial to both of those, but I'm kind of not allowed to drink them. Okay. So. All right. Well, we're gonna drink some epic stuff today. Okay. Okay. So number one, my number one favorite whiskey of all time. Okay, is George T. Stack. And we have a bottle right here next to you, but it is not open. Mm. You ever fresh cracked a, a B Tech no. before? No. Let's do it. Okay. You do it. Go ahead. I, I don't know. I know. What do you want me to do? Well, I mean, figure it out. It's not. Shut up. Figure it out. Look, there's a little pull tab and everything. Yeah, just, you got the fingernails for it. I normally have to use a knife. Too good. Okay, if you whisper, they can't hear you. You gotta talk louder. Okay, look at that, I figured out your bottle. I figured you would. Perfect. Yes, sir. Okay, we got clean glens here. Um, now... <clears throat> Splashy poo. Okay, wait, well maybe give me some of that then, because that's, <laughs> that's a good bit. That's, a good, that's more than enough for us to both yeah, taste Yeah, just it. a splash. Okay. She still, she still kept the majority for herself. I thought you were gonna pour more for yourself. <laughs> All right. Win. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. Okay. So smell it up. What do you think? No polish remover. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, it smells nice. Does it smell nice? What are you getting on the nose? There's a good bit of fruit. There's some cherry. Okay. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna smile and nod at you. You're the one with the good nose. I know, but. Fig, you getting under, any fig? Not under pressure. Well, you're gonna have to figure it out because you're gonna be a regular show guest. Now you got all these fans. Fine. Yeah. I'm gonna drink it. Okay. So think, some things to know about George C. Stagg. So George C. Stagg is part of the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection. It is one of five annual release whiskeys. Um, there's gonna be a second one featured here in a minute. Uh, it is unobtainium. It's hard to get. The MSRP is only 99 to like $119, depending on what area it's being sold in. You know, they have different taxes and things, different distribution costs. Um, so it's not a super expensive whiskey. The problem is, is it's just impossible to get your hands on. And there are people who like to say that they love one year and they hate another year. I've never tasted a George C. Stagg that I didn't think was excellent whiskey. But my favorite that I've owned for sure, and I think my favorite that I've ever tasted is 2017, and that is the bottle that you just fresh cracked. And so... It's super yummy. Yeah. How do you taste it? You pick anything else up? I'm having a hard time putting my finger on it, but like, I, 
I just really like it. It's yummy. Yeah, there's like a, a, a dry, dark fruit flavor, like a like maybe a fig, maybe prune. Um, there's some, some cherry notes in there. <clears throat> Not very medicinal. It's more like just a dark cherry. Um, there's some chocolate, there's some leather, there's some tobacco. Um, there's like a sweet pipe tobacco. That's like the hallmark for me for George C. Stag. Which we'll be pouring a, um, a cigar candle for you soon. Oh. So we'll have like a sweet tobacco. That one's been out of stock. It has been out of stock. Yeah. So interesting thing about George C. Stag, and I bet you didn't know this. So yeah. the distillery that produces probably more or at least the greatest number of SKUs or, or different brands that are on allocation is Buffalo Trace because they make all of the Pappy Van Winkle line now. They make the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection, the Buffalo Trace Experimental Collection, OFC, um, Eagle uh, uh, Double or Eagle Very Rare, I think is what it's called. So they have a lot of the really expensive, really hard to find things. And George T. Stagg was actually kind of the guy that built the distillery up. So when it was originally started, it was called OFC, which was Old Fired Copper Distillery. And I think they started in 1870. In 1904, George T. Stagg was the owner of the brand. He changed the name from OFC to George T. Stagg Distillery. And it stayed George T. Stagg Distillery until 1992, when it was switched to Buffalo Trace, which is the name that we all know it as today. So ki kind of kind of interesting. But all in all, excellent whiskey, long finish, hard to find, but probably, like if you put a gun to my head and you were like, I want you to pick one whiskey and it's the only whiskey that you're ever allowed to drink for the rest of your life, cost is no issue, just assume that you can get as much of it as you want, what would you drink? It would be this bottle right here. Hey, Bourbon Real Talk watchers and listeners, Randy Sullivan with a real quick commercial break. So if you haven't noticed, this channel does not have any sponsors because I wanna be completely independent as I provide valuable information to you. And I also don't have a Patreon. So if you were wondering how you could support the channel, here's how, we have merch. So one of the things that we have that we're pretty excited about are these Glen Lanyards. If you've ever gone to a whiskey tasting, this thing is clutch. Secondly, we have Bourbon Real Talk branded Glen Karens. Now, a lot of guys think candles are just for girls, but that's not the case because Bourbon Real Talk has been thinking about all of you men out there or women who like more masculine scents. And we have masculine scented candles. We've got leather, charcoal, and tonka. And as you get more excited about the whiskey enthusiast game, you're going to start to collect samples. And those samples are going to clutter up your shelf. So I made these lovely storage boxes. We have two sizes. They are actually solid wood. They come pre-stained. They hold 36 a piece. So we have one that's a one ounce and one that's a two ounce. But if you want the creme de la creme of Bourbon Real Talk merch, you're gonna wanna get one of these Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kits. This has 36 different scents that would commonly be found in American whiskey. And this kit has actually made its mark on the world. There is one major Kentucky distillery, soon to be two. They use this kit to train their sensory team. So if you wanna get on that level, you can pick up one of these. Now, if you're just a casual listener and you don't wanna pick up any merch and you just wanna come and you wanna learn, I'm happy to have you as a listener. But if you wanna support the channel, Best way to do it is to head over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick something up. Number two favorite bourbon of all time is, well, for me, well, I, it's my list. So, you know, if someone watches this and then they're upset that I, I gave my list, then, you know, start your own YouTube channel. Anyway, so number two favorite bourbon of all time is William LaRue Weller. It's almost empty. It is almost empty. So do you want to tell them how I acquired this bottle? Is that the one that I like snuck for you? Yeah. 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 I, I went into a liquor store. Is that not the one? No, you, you won the lottery. Oh, that's right. Okay. There was one that like I walked in and said, my husband collects whiskey. And the guy like took me to you know, the little pin that they keep all the stuff. And they're like, here, give him this. And then you opened it and you're like, oh my God, how'd you get that? Yeah, we're going to have to drink out of one glass. We can. 
Yeah. So bottle kill. So uh, that's not the way we got this bottle. The way we got this bottle was the lottery. Three. Was you won the lottery uh, from Goody Goody, and the store manager knew me, and knew that it would be a great big surprise for me if he just reached out to you directly because to enter the lottery, you had to enter the cell phone number. So I called him and I asked if you had won and he told me no and he knew he was lying. And then the next time I was in there, he acted like, oh, well maybe I could get you something. If I could get you something, what would you want? And I told him William Livery Weller. And then he knew what to tell you to pick. So how shocked was my face the day? That That's I the best. It's Im impossible to surprise you with whiskey. Yeah. Like impossible. Yeah. They, I've joked that I'm just gonna start buying like the no-name stuff off the shelf and just be like, yeah, just try. Um, cause I can't get the ungettable stuff cause, you know. Mm. So what do you get on this one? I, I don't, I couldn't put my finger on it. Like there's something specific and I, so it's a it's it's a weeded bourbon, so it doesn't have rye in it. It's wheat instead of rye. Okay. And it's it's a little bit more um, citrusy. See, I was gonna say lemon, like I smelled lemon, but like it was something like citrusy. Let me let me. It's very. It's got a lot of. Um, it's like a peppery note or something. There's a little bit of spice on the finish, which you would normally associate with a rye-based whiskey. But I think that the, the spice that I'm getting is more barrel flavor. Um, so this, this particular, so the first one that we tried, the George C. Stag is a 15 year aged. It's not age dated, but it's 15 years aged. William Lou Weller, and one of the factoids about this that's interesting is because this is also Buffalo Trace Distillery, also 99 to $199 MSRP, also impossible to get your hands on but it's effectively cash strength Pappy Van Winkle, right? Like everybody freaks out over Pappy Van Winkle. Um, the difference being it's cash strength. So once it's done aging, they don't add any water to it. They just bottle it the way that it came out of the barrel. And, and two, it's a little bit younger than most of the Van, well, I guess it's in the middle. It's about 12 and a half typically. Um, somewhere around 12 and a half, 13 years old, something like that. And so you've got the old Rip Van Winkle 10 year, you've got the Van Winkle Lot B that's a 12 year, and then you have Pappy Van Winkle 15 year. So this is between the Lot B and the Pappy, but at a much higher proof. Uh, this one's 128, um, so that's, that's pretty hot. But for 128 proof whiskey, it, it's easy to drink because it's very, all the flavors are well integrated. So would you say that it's like smooth? <laughs> I would, I would not, I was trying not to say that word, but yes, it is very smooth whiskey. <laughs> it's really smooth. Me, yeah, meaning it's, it's easy to drink, even though it's a pretty high proof. It's really yummy. When you taste it, you get anything else? I get a little bit of smoke. Yeah. Taste it, see if you get some smoke. But it's like, it reminds me of, um, I took our son camping once mm. and you know how it doesn't matter where you sit around the campfire, the smoke comes towards you. Um, we had gathered up all this scrub oak that we were cooking our dinner no, on and all that. All I can think of. Yeah. It, it tastes like that sweet campfire smoke. But not in a gross way. It's not like... No, no, no. No, it's still, it's still excellent. I don't want to finish it. Okay. Well, I'll cut it for you. Well, it's one of your favorites. Mm -hmm. Number three of my favorite bourbons of all time is E.H. Taylor Barrel Proof. So this one, they make a small batch. They make a um, single barrel. And those are both bottle and bond whiskey. So they're 100 proof. This one is their cash drink offering. And a uh, little interesting factoid, E.H. Taylor uh, one of the things he's most well known for is the first consumer protection law in the United States, which is the Bottom Bond Act of 1897. And it basically made rules that said that um, if you wanted to label your whiskey as bottled and bond, 
it had to be sold in a bottle and not by, you know, the barrel or whatever, because they used to sell a lot of whiskey by the barrel. But what that meant is that the distillery could seal it up before it sent it out to the public. And when you got it and you opened it, you knew that it, would, it hadn't been tampered with. And so it was a consumer protection law. And he fought very hard for that. And so uh, bottled and bond whiskeys are, you know, kind of his, part of his legacy. Uh, but this particular offering can't be a bottled and bond because it is a cash strength and bottled and bond has to be exactly 100 proof. So that's kind of an interesting tidbit. So let's smell it up. Tell us what you think. This one's very vanilla forward for me, which is, I also get the cherries on it. But I get like a pineapple note too. A little tropical fruit. Okay. Maybe some mango. Or guava. Since very fruity. Mm. Yeah, I feel like I can like there's something tropical like I'm thinking pineapple or something. So would it blow your mind to find out that this whiskey and George T. Stagg are the same thing? They're the same whiskey. They are. Except this one's 15 years old and this one's six to eight years old. Mm. So Buffalo Trace makes three different bourbon mash bills. And I was shocked to find out that one of my friends didn't know this. She made a post in the whiskey club. I was like, oh my God, I just found out that Buffalo Trace is the same thing as George C. Stagg. And there are three bourbon mash bills. Buffalo Trace mash bill one is what they make. George T. Stagg and Eagle Rare and Stagg Jr. and E.H. Taylor and Buffalo Trace and a bunch of others that I'm not thinking of right now. And then Buffalo Trace mash bill two is what they make. Blanton's, uh, Hancock's, uh, John J. Bowman. Uh, what's the inexpensive one? Anyway, they make a bunch out of that. And then the weeded mash bill from Buffalo Trace, that's a bourbon mash bill, is what they make all of the um, Weller line and, and Pappy Van Winkle. And so <clears throat> I didn't know that, right? I just, I happened, this was probably 2016, back before this stuff was unobtainium, right? Now you can't get it. And I found a store that had them on the shelf and I bought one because I knew I liked E.H. Taylor and it's a cash strength whiskey, right? And the MSRP on this has gone up a little bit. Um, I, th I think this one's closer to, or no, 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 this one's still low. This one's around $75 is MSRP, but I mean, it, there are stores selling it for all different prices. But um, when, when I found this bottle for the first time, I, I drank it all Saturday one day and it the proof was so high that when I woke up on Sunday the skin was coming off the inside of my cheek <laughs> from drinking castric whiskey all day what do you think it's yummy I feel like I've said that a lot yeah well I mean like these are the best bourbons of all time so if you just kept saying they were yummy it would totally make sense yeah. But I mean, if you're saying that like these are the same, if we're putting these two guys side by side, mm -hmm. I like that one a little more. And you should. Um, and, and part of that has to do with barrel selection, right? Because there are tasting teams that it's their job to identify what barrels taste like George C. Stagg. But from a production standpoint... Okay, this one's younger, this one's older, all of that. Sure. From a production standpoint, they're both put in barrels that were produced at the same cooperage using the same char level techniques. There, theoretically, there may be differences in aging warehouses and floor levels and things like that. Um, and we don't have that level of detail, you know? Uh, but yeah, I mean, Colonel H. Taylor Barrel Proof, it's a winner every time. I've never had one I didn't love. Number four, best bourbons of all time. Four Roses, small batch, limited 
edition. Okay. Well, don't just K me. Like, you also got this bottle for me. Did I? I'm so great. Yes. How'd you do that? I have no idea. I don't remember which bottle I get you for which thing. If I can just get a bottle that someone tells me that you're going to be excited about. How is that even? Like, explain to the people <laughs> how it's possible that you acquired this epic bottle of whiskey and you have no recollection of it. Is this the one from this year? Uh-huh. Okay, so you have enough friends now mm -hmm. that they will message me and say, hey, do you have something for Randy for Christmas? And I'll say no. And then they'll be like, I've got this thing. So now I have people that look out for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what I'm buying, but I trust that if they get me the wrong thing, then... They'll get caught when I open it. it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, um, someone reached out to me and um, I bought this for you for Christmas, birthday. Birthday. I think this is birthday. Okay. It, because my birthday is one month after Christmas. I it, don't know. It's true. So what happened is that she was afraid to make the purchase. So she came to me and she said, Did I? yeah, she said, is Four Roses limited edition a good buy at this price? Okay. And I was like, yeah, it pretty much is. So I assumed I was getting it for Christmas. Okay, so on Christmas Day... I feel like that's a rookie move. I, 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 did that. I open up the box, and it is a bottle of Elijah Craig 18. That's true. Which I do not like very much. But I have to have one at all times because everybody wants to try it. It's just too oaky for me. It's not because it's bad. It's just not my palate, right? But I always want to have one. So I was super excited to get it. I was super pumped. Plus, they're single barrels, so they're all different. Um, and so, but I was slightly disappointed because I really love the Four Roses limited edition. And I used to get one every year from our local liquor store. I, I had enough of their reward points or whatever that I, they would give me one every year. And then they skipped me one year, but they gave me something else. And I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever happened there, that's cool. And then they just, they just lost my number. And now I don't get any. So I was a little disappointed because I thought it was coming. And then when I opened up on my birthday, I was like, you sly dog. And the funny thing was, is that the person who set the deal up, he knew the whole time. And I saw him between Christmas and my birthday and I said something to him about it. And he still kept it quiet. So let's taste it up. I think it's the most flowery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Four Roses is very, roses. very floral. Second. Yeah. Uh, is that, I mean, does that have anything to do with it? Okay. No, but they happen to develop a, so Four Roses has, has uh, 10 different bourbon recipes. They have uh, two different combinations of grains, what they call a mash bill, right? One that has 20% rye and one that has, I don't, I don't remember the numbers. It's probably on here actually. And then there's five different yeast strains. And so the combination of the two different mash bills and the five different yeast strains and the different yeast produce different flavors, create 10 different whiskeys, and then they blend those together to make this. So they have two other major product lines. One is called uh, the Four Roses Small Batch, and that one is only four of the 10 recipes. Then they have a Small Batch Select, which is six of the 10 recipes. But this limited edition can have all 10 in it and i interviewed brent elliott the master distiller who's in charge of creating this product every year and he basically told me that this whiskey is the thing that makes him feel like he can flex his creative muscles right because he can do anything with this and he's got so much to play with such a great palette um so you know it's pretty exciting but this was one of the first ultra premium whiskeys that I tasted when I got into whiskey and I've just always loved it. I feel like it tastes a lot different than it smells. Yeah, so this one, the MSRP is a little bit higher. I think it's uh, 150. Um, but they, they will pr put information out about what's in here. And if I remember correctly, this one's the 2020. I think that there was some 16 year old in here. And Four Roses typically doesn't age their product super high. And so if you, if you want to taste a higher aged, you know, flavor for roses, you either got to get lucky and find a single barrel that's got a little bit more age on it. And most of the single barrels that they release, I think the highest one they ever released was 16. They did that distillery only. 
Um, and then, you know, or you got to get a limited edition that has some of those, you know, higher age barrels blended into it. But it's amazing whiskey. I don't think I've ever had a Four Roses limited edition that I didn't think was amazing. Uh, so that's part of the reason why it's one of my favorites. But on the nose, you know, you got, it's just fruity floral. Mm -hmm. There's, there's so many fruit scents. There's so many floral scents. It's hard to put your finger on any one thing. Um, and on the limited edition, especially you get a little bit of those higher age notes where you will smell a hint of like a earthy, like leathery type note. You'll get a hint of smoke and things that don't come through on the younger products as much. Uh, they also age their barrels in one story warehouses. Um, and so there's not a lot of temperature variance. It's not like, you know, wild turkey's got 15 different levels and the stuff at the top ages completely different than the stuff at the bottom. They just have one story, you know, warehouses, which is very expensive, uh, but it produces a more consistent flavor for the product. So, you know, all in all, it's a great product. Number five and our final for our top five best bourbons of all time, of all time, we have Blanton's straight from the barrel. So everything that we tasted so far is labeled as a cash strength or a barrel proof. And those two terms mean the same thing. It just means that when they get done aging it, whatever the proof is, that's, that's what, it throw it in a bottle, right? Um, and, but Blanton's, their version of that, they call it straight from the barrel. And I don't think anybody else that I know of in major production calls it that, except for a Japanese whiskey. There's a Japanese whiskey that does it like that. But we're, al we're almost out of this one as well. Yeah, we we're almost out of this one. We probably will. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. It's okay if we do some body bottle killsies, you know. People, people like to see that. You gotta drink the good stuff. What are you getting on this one? There's a fruit note. Wait, if I say peach? Oh, you crushed it, girl! I'm and I'm bad at finding peach. I I had to get I had to get the aroma kit out. Yeah, I mean it only takes me five five pours to get it right. No, no, no. I get peaches on this one. I get peaches on all Blantons. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell what it was until I got the aroma kit out. Yeah. And then I, and then I I put my finger on it. And it's like oh, okay, that's cool. So this product is, um, they're just now selling it in the United States. So this, this, this product has an interesting history with, with bourbon in general. So bourbon was doing terribly and there were a lot of distilleries that were shutting their doors. They were, there were a lot of mergers going on and they started to realize that the most popular market in the world for bourbon was Japan. And so they started making products specifically to target consumers in Japan. And during this time frame, you know, the concept of a premium bourbon was launched because, you know, there was a, there was a point in time that, you know, $50 for a bottle of bourbon, Jesus Christ, are you out of your mind? Like, no, absolutely not. Right. And they needed to shift the public's mindset to be able to resurrect bourbon. And there was a gentleman named uh, Elmer T. Lee, and he was the master distiller for Buffalo Trace. This is also a Buffalo Trace product. Um, so we already talked about my number one and my number three being the same mash bill from the same distillery. Uh, my number two is the weeded mash bill from that distillery. And my number five is the high rye bourbon mash bill from that distillery. Um, they don't disclose what the rye percentage is. And I've read some weird stuff online that it's actually not that much of a difference, but it has to do with the, when they add the rye to the mash. I'm not sure that I believe that. Um, but anyway, it's the higher rye mash bill, what they call Buffalo Trace mash bill two. And one of the things that's interesting about this story is that the bourbon world had been suffering for a very long time and partly it was their own fault because of the way that they had marketed their product. And if you were to go back and look at the advertising in the 70s and the 80s, if you weren't a southern white gentleman, the advertising wasn't for you. You know, they didn't really target women for the most part. They didn't really target minorities. And 
you know, it was Kentucky. So there hasn't always been exact equality in the, the bourbon production world. But Elmer T. Lee uh, served in uh, the military and fought in war with a gentleman who ended up being the warehouse manager. So it was his job to manage the people that moved the barrels around in the warehouses and all that stuff. And Elmer T. Lee was in charge of production and he would have been over maturation too. And they were friends because they served together in the war. Uh, difference being, he was a black man. And um, I believe his name was uh, Jimmy. Um, and his son now works at the distillery, uh, Freddie Johnson. And Jimmy, being in charge of the warehouse, knew where the sweet spots were. He was able to figure out, like, oh, like the barrels that come out of this warehouse, they taste a cut above the rest. And while they were searching for new marketing ideas to kind of resurrect bourbon, he went to Elmer T. Lee and said, like, hey, I had this idea. What if we took these really special barrels and we bottled them alone? Like, like we didn't mix the barrels together. We just find a great barrel and we showcase how great that one barrel was by bottling it separate and call it a single barrel. And that was a super novel concept back then because... All the bourbon brands' main objective was consistency of flavor. They didn't want somebody to pick up a bottle and it not taste the exact same as the last bottle that they had of that same product. But they were looking for things to make bourbon stick out. And it's super expensive to bottle single barrel bourbons because of the way that you had to run your production line. But they were desperate enough to kind of throw a Hail Mary pass and they tried it and it worked. And so Blanton's is one of the most popular whiskeys in the world today. It blew up in Japan, and this product uh, was sold only in Japan until this last year. I believe that probably Donald Trump's tariffs making it so expensive for people overseas to buy the bourbon maybe tamped down on the sales enough, or maybe they got ahead of the production curve. I don't know. But they were able to start releasing Blanton straight from the barrel and another uh, skew that they have called Blanton's Gold um, in the United States for the first time. Uh, but this, this, Blanton's, or this whiskey has a historical significance, um, not only because it's one of the most well-known instances recently of an African-American actually be rec recognized for his contribution to bourbon, because when Elmer T. Lee received his award for you know, I don't know if it's a Lifetime Achievement Award or whatever, but when he received his award for having helped resurrect bourbon because he created Blanton's, he called Jimmy up onto the stage and recognized him in front of everybody to just say like, hey, you know, this is a guy that had a huge part in bringing this idea to life, right? And so not only is it historically sig significant for bourbon in general, but it's also historically significant for African, Ameri African Americans and their contribution in the bourbon world. So I feel like that's a good one to end on too. It's big. Yeah, it's big. All right. You got anything else to add? You want to talk to your fans? No? What am I going to say? I don't know. Is it weird that I smell like, like I'm, I'm thinking of like baby powder, like the heliotrope in our, in our kit. Yeah. Only, only when I, when I, taste it not when i smell it like i smell peaches but i taste like a powder or something yeah that's fair a uh, heliotrope is is a flower that it's basically what baby um is it baby oil or baby powder smells like it's one of the two but anyway i think it's baby oil baby oil smells exactly like the heliotrope in flower and it's in our aroma kit uh thank you jackie zykin for that idea um but yeah so that's uh that's, that's pretty much it. So if you're tuning in for the first time, um, these are my top five bourbons. If you ever get a chance to get them, I think you should check them out. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the show philosophy. So this channel is about bringing people together around bourbon. And the whole concept is, is that bourbon is a communal resource that's meant to be shared. For whatever reason, everybody in the back of their lizard brain looks at bourbon as something that you're supposed to share with others. And it brings people together. I've seen situations where people 
that if they actually dug down into their differences, whether it be religious or political or racial or whatever their differences were, they maybe wouldn't have been able to feel as connected. But because all they were doing is sitting down and having a glass of whiskey together, they had a great time, they got to know each other, and there was compassion and caring and connection. And that's important to me. And part of the reason why that's important to me is because I lost a loved one to suicide in 2014. And that came as a shock to me because I didn't know that my brother felt that alone. I didn't know that he felt that helpless. And I wanted to find a way to help people feel connected to the world around them. And I stumbled across the connected power of bourbon as my hobby. And I thought, hey, um, I don't necessarily have to connect people with each other. If I can connect people with bourbon and they get connected in the community and they start to spend time with people, they can't feel alone. They'll be around people that they know care about them. And so that's part of the mission of this channel. And I always end every episode with the same sign off. And I, I realized, especially during political cycles, you'll see people fighting online, saying hateful things to one another, saying they hate each other and they've never even met or talked in person. And I figure that if someone can hate a stranger on the internet, it's just as easy for me to love them. And so that's why I sign off the same way every time, and that is this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk.